Tonight, the winter seemingly without end gets worse in New England. More snow, now a deep freeze as the next storm forms down south. ISIS releases a new video of the execution of 21 Christians. A hacker group may have stolen $1 billion from banks around the world. The FAA is out with guidelines for commercial drones. And enjoy the museum, just leave behind the selfie stick. This is the CBS Evening News. Hi everyone, I'm Jeff Glor. The snow is rising, the records and the temperature keep falling. Take a look at the expected lows overnight in the Northeast with the wind chill. Binghamton, New York, 30 below. Pittsfield, Massachusetts, 36 below. Berlin, New Hampshire, 39 below zero. In Norwood, Mass, the snow Kim Taylor is trying to remove is as tall as she is. In Boston, this homeowner aimed a leaf blower outside an upstairs window trying to clear the snow off a rooftop. Why? Because this can happen. On Garfield Street in Quincy, a house collapsed. We have two reports tonight, including the forecast. We begin with Jerika Duncan in Boston. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour whipped up the additional 16 inches of snow Boston received Sunday, creating whiteout conditions. More than 600 plows throughout the city are doing the heavy lifting and moving. Snow melters aren't getting any breaks. Boston Mayor Marty Walsh is at a loss for words. I know that as I was walking out of my house today, I, I just didn't know what to say. People are frustrated, people just want this to end. I think we all want the spring to come. Since Saturday, nearly 400 vehicles have been ticketed, more than 200 towed. Right now, cars are not allowed to park downtown. Two-way streets have been changed to one-way, and the city's transit system is out of service. Businesses have lost major business, the restaurants and locals, business retailers, but also the bigger ones. Um, you know, it's been a tough month for everybody. What do you think the economic impact has been? Oh, I think it's going to be big. Uh, I'm not sure I can't put a dollar for you to right now. At the Quincy Market, tourists were the only ones there. 26-year-old Yen Chen Shi is visiting Boston with a group from China. It's amazing for me because I've never seen this heavy snow before. I'm from the south part of China, so it's actually great. But unfortunately, all the shops are closed. <laughs> Brandy Andrews has lived here over 10 years. She considers herself lucky. I love the snow because I live in an apartment, just wake up and somebody else has shoveled for me. I don't have to drive anywhere. Is it what you expected? Yes, everything I expected and more. <laughs> The city's homeless shelters are at overflow capacity. Tonight, Jeff, I'm told more than 600 people are seeking safety in those nearby shelters because of this dangerously cold weather. All right, Jerika Duncan, thank you. Eric Fisher is chief meteorologist at our Boston station, WBZ. Eric, what is ahead? Uh, Jeff, it's just brutal out there behind this blizzard. You're talking wind chill values in the northeast in particular, 20 to 35 below zero. You could see frostbite in less than 30 minutes with conditions like that. A lot of cold out there for our Monday morning for President's Day. We're also tracking a new storm. This is a mid-south winter storm. Lots of warnings that are out across the region. This storm will be tracking eastward starting tonight and then tomorrow some heavy snowfall, ice to the southern side of all of that snow, and then it tracks into the northeast as we head toward Tuesday. Additional snow, places like New York City and Boston. Really the bullseye for snow Kentucky over a half foot of accumulation expected there. We will see some significant totals over toward DC and into New York. Boston yet again could see a half foot of fresh snowfall and with all of this a lot of cold Jeff the whole central and eastern part of the US 20 to 40 degrees below average for a big chunk of this week. Eric Fisher thank you very much. At least 15 people were hurt today in a multi-car pileup in Chicago. It happened this morning on the Kennedy Expressway. 38 vehicles were involved. There were whiteout conditions. None of the injuries are considered life-threatening. Overseas, we are learning more tonight about the suspect accused of two deadly terror attacks in Denmark yesterday. Police say the gunman opened fire on a free speech meeting and later outside a synagogue before officers gunned him down. Here's Charlie Daggett. The first light of dawn fell on the body of the suspected killer after the firefight with police that brought his rampage and his life to an end. Danish media quoting police forces identified the suspect as 22-year-old Omar Abdel Hamid El Hussein. Born in Denmark, he had a criminal record that included violence and weapons offenses. 
They said he acted as a lone wolf when he opened fire yesterday on a cafe during an event on free speech. An audio recording obtained by the BBC captured the moment. Why do we still say but when we... <laughs> Inside was Agnieszka Kolek. I could hear the, the gunshots uh, approaching, so I thought the, the gunman must be already in the building. I could hear um, Arabic and, uh, and the shouts, Allahu Akbar. His next attack targeted the synagogue after midnight, shooting an unarmed man who stood watch outside. Today, Danish Prime Minister Hella Thorning Schmidt visited and paid tribute. A uh, man has lost his life in a service uh, of that uh, uh, synagogue, and we are uh, devastated. Danish intelligence said the suspect had been on the agency's radar. But tonight, as mourners held candlelight vigils for the victims, they're left to wonder why more wasn't done to stop the attacks from happening. Police raided an internet cafe today where they made four arrests in connection with the investigation. Jeff, they're also looking into whether the suspect may have been inspired by ISIS messages and videos, although there's no evidence to suggest he traveled to conflict zones like Syria and Iraq. Charlie Daggett in London. Charlie, thank you. Hundreds of Jewish graves have been desecrated in northern France. At a cemetery in northern France, nearly 200 gravestones were knocked down. Others painted with swastikas and Nazi slogans. In a statement, President Francois Hollande called the attack, quote, odious and barbaric. ISIS released a new video today showing the execution of 21 Coptic Christians kidnapped in Libya. The video shows the Egyptian prisoners being marched onto a beach by militants dressed in black. Then the prisoners are beheaded brutally. Juan Zarate is the senior national security analyst for CBS News. He joins us from Washington. Uh, Juan, what's significant about this? Jeff, this video really marks ISIS on the world stage, well beyond the videos that we've seen in the past out of Syria and Iraq. This is the first beheading video that we've seen outside of that region in Libya. Keep in mind that ISIS has established beachheads in Libya, in Egypt, and is gaining adherence and alliances around the world. And so this demonstrates and underscores that. In addition, it marks the targets that ISIS is engaged in. They are targeting the people of the cross, the Coptic Christians and the Egyptians, who are now uh, their enemies. And finally, it demonstrates that ISIS is not going to be cowed by the criticism that they felt in light of the recent horrific videos. This is a group at war, and these videos are a window into that reality. Uh, and one on the subject of those horrific videos, uh, we saw how the Jordanians reacted when a fighter pilot was burned to death. Uh, the Egyptians are reacting to this now. What more can we expect? Well, I think the Egyptians will have to react. President Sisi has already gathered his security council to talk about what form that will take. No doubt the Egyptians will want to find some way of attacking ISIS. The challenge for Egypt is that they have their own challenges internally. They're fighting Islamic radical terrorists internally in the Sinai and trying to keep Cairo safe. And so uh, Egypt will be at war with ISIS. We'll just have to see what form that ultimately takes. Juan Zarate, Juan, thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. After more than 24 hours, the ceasefire in Ukraine is largely holding except in one town. That is Debaltseva, where Russian-backed rebels had surrounded Ukrainian troops. The commander there said his men have the right to keep shooting, claiming the territory is theirs. The FAA today released its proposed regulations for commercial drones. The government wants to make sure drones can safely share the skies with planes and helicopters. Here's Juliana Goldman. The proposed rules apply to commercial drones, opening the skies to crop monitoring, aerial photography, videography, and maybe someday package and pizza deliveries. The guidelines cover drones that weigh up to 55 pounds and require that they be only flown within sight during daylight hours below 500 feet and no faster than 100 miles per hour. Operators need to be at least 17 years old, pass an aeronautics test and be vetted by the TSA. Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox unveiled the regulations in a conference call Sunday morning. We have been working to develop a framework for the safe integration of this technology into our airspace. So-called hobbyist drones, like the one that accidentally crashed at the White House last month, are operated under a different set of guidelines, which have existed for years. 
Along with the new FAA rules, the White House wants agencies to set policies on the government's use of domestic drones, like those flying along the U.S.-Mexico border. The president wants guidelines spelled out for commercial and private drones around issues of privacy, accountability and transparency. One trade group projects that by 2025, the industry will create more than 100,000 jobs with an economic impact of $82 billion. Brian Wynn is the president of the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. As people get used to the value and the benefits of these ideas, I think they'll become uh, more excited about the possibilities that this technology can, can be put to use for. It could take years before these rules are set, and industry representatives say it's also unclear how the president's memorandum issued on Sunday will impact the final rule. So, Jeff, don't expect to be getting that drone delivery anytime soon. Uh, I will not. Juliana Goldman, thank you very much. From Washington, seven people aboard a flight to Hawaii were injured when their plane hit turbulence. United Flight 15 took off from Newark, bound for Honolulu. It encountered high winds. Four crew members and a teenage girl were hospitalized. Police say an alleged road rage incident uh, has led to a murder in Las Vegas. Tammy Myers was with her 14-year-old daughter when she got into a near collision that led to an argument. Her husband says the other driver then followed her home and she was killed. Police are looking for the gunman tonight. Coming up here, how could a gang of cyber thieves pull off a billion dollar bank heist? And where Westminster dogs get treated like stars when the CBS Evening News continues. The Russian cybersecurity firm Kaspersky Lab says since 2013, one hacker group may have stolen up to a billion dollars from banks around the world. Kaspersky says the cyber attacks are still happening. Here's how they say it works. Hackers send emails containing a malware program to bank employees. The malware installs programs that record computer keystrokes and take screenshots of bank computers. The hackers can then figure out the bank's inner workings and eventually how to remotely control the bank's computers. The hackers can then transfer money or make e-payments into fraudulent bank accounts or even direct ATMs to spit out money at whatever time and place they choose. This full report comes out tomorrow, but joining us tonight is Chris Doggett. He is the managing director of Kaspersky North America. He joins us from Boston. Chris, thank you for being with us. Uh, first, I want to ask you, how did you discover this? Well, we first got involved in investigating Carbonac uh, when a bank in Kiev called us up. They had uh, discovered an external connection to uh, a server in China, which shouldn't be there, and uh, they knew they needed help, and so we sent in a forensics team. Carbonac is this, is this malware you're talking about. Uh, Chris, are American banks involved? Uh, we think that there may be American banks involved, yes. We do see target IP addresses from the hacker servers to institutions uh, in the U.S. You're not releasing the names of the banks involved, um, but this is a lot of money. What, what, why no names? Well, it is an ongoing operation. That is to say, the attackers are still currently uh, stealing money from the banks. Uh, there are obviously law enforcement investigations that are active and underway um, in multiple countries, multiple jurisdictions. And uh, we do not want to compromise any of those investigations by releasing any specific information about victims. Chris, explain this to me a little bit, if you would. I know there's a couple different uh, things that you say the hackers were doing, but one of them is they would go into somebody's account, for example, who had $1,000 in there, and, and then add a zero. So, so it looked like there was 10000 in there, and then they would transfer $9,000 out, let's say. So that goes into a fraudulent account, and, and the person doesn't realize it because it looks like there's still just $1,000 in again, correct? That's exactly right. Um, what these attackers were able to do, which is really uh, something we haven't seen before, is essentially to hide uh, their activities in plain sight. Uh, they were able to disguise what they were doing as legitimate banking transactions. And in doing so, uh, it was very difficult for anyone, whether it was the account holder or the bank, to pick up on what they were doing. How concerned should banking customers be tonight? Well, I think it does call into question the, uh, the integrity and some of the controls that are in place in some of the banks, um, in particular with respect to security itself. Uh, and so it is a note of serious concern for people. Chris Doggett from Kaspersky, thank you very much for joining us from Boston tonight. 
Midnight tonight is the deadline for enrolling in Obamacare. Many were prevented from enrolling yesterday by a glitch, but officials say the site is back up and running. Those who miss the deadline do not have insurance already and are above the federal poverty line will face a tax penalty. Up next, why more museums want you to check your selfie stick at the door. You could be the Leonardo da Vinci of the selfie, and all of your self-portraits could be masterpieces. But a growing number of museums are banning selfie sticks in order to protect priceless arts and treasured artifacts. Here's Don Daler. Uh, I'm right in front of the Natural History Museum. Selfie sticks hold a camera or smartphone farther than an arm's reach away for that perfect pic of family and friends and or self. They've been around since 2005, but in the past year, they've become nearly ubiquitous. The selfie taker in chief goofed around with one for his latest Obamacare push. Laura Rodriguez used a selfie stick during a recent visit to the American Museum of Natural History, where they are permitted. You can take uh, good pictures of the things that are inside the museums. Self-portraits are a cherished art form practiced by the likes of Van Gogh, Kahlo, Picasso. But a growing number of museums, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, don't see selfie sticks as objects of beauty. Sri Srinivasan is chief digital officer at the Met. So what is the concern? The concern is that the selfie sticks can do damage to our art, to our visitors, and the selfie stick users themselves. They're so distracted that they're not paying attention. And when you don't pay attention, you could trip, you could fall off our balconies, you could, all kinds of things could happen. So there's no objection to taking pictures, it's using this pole and having it wave around. Absolutely. We are pro-selfie, just not pro-selfie stick. Also leave the sticks at home if you're planning on visiting the Getty Center in L.A. and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, among others. What are some of the options that people can use? We, I have one of these here. It's a attachment you add to your cell phone, and once you put it on there, then it gives you a wide-angle shot. You can also make sure the tallest person in the group is always reaching out and taking the picture himself the guy or with herself. The longest arm. That's right. Or simply enjoy the art for art's sake. Uncle Ned will just have to trust that you were there. Don Daler, CBS News, New York. Still ahead here tonight, one of New York's finest hotels for dogs caters to the Westminster crowd. More than 3,000 dogs are in New York City for the start of the Westminster Kennel Club show tomorrow. And several hotels are giving the dogs the VIP treatment. Here's Lauren Lister. The show attracts dedicated competitors, like trainer Jesse Carlson and his dogs Nicholas and Tatiana. A lot of these dogs that come to Westminster have been showing all year. You know, we've worked all year to get to this point. They want everything to be perfect. Hey, buddy! And that's where he comes in. The doggy concierge is Jerry. I'm the doggy concierge. Jerry Grimek is in public relations. Sit, sit, boy, sit. But for one week a year, he drops everything to cater to these guests during their stay at New York's Hotel Pennsylvania. We are expecting between 600 to 700 dogs this weekend. And I got to tell you, we welcome them with open paws. You can insert your favorite dog pun here, but Jerry's probably already got it covered. We literally treat them as VIPs, very important pooches, and they demand specific attention. That attention starts with what Grimek calls the dog spa, a bathing area, grooming tables, their own bathroom, and for exercise, you can do it. there are doggy treadmills, there's gourmet food, and portrait sessions too. Then there are the requests. Well, there was one time where they say extra pillows and a cot. So we'd bring a cot and the owner would sleep on a cot and the dog would sleep on the bed. We had an opera singer serenading a dog. Less outrageous requests have been red carpets to be rolled out for a dog. Oh, that's less outrageous. I saw, compared to the opera singer, yes. Yeah. Why all the fuss? Grimex says owners want to make sure their dogs get the best treatment. You're coming here to compete against the top dogs in the country. On the road to best in show. Lauren Lister, CBS News, New York. That is the CBS Evening News tonight. Later on CBS 60 Minutes, including Bob Simon's final report. 
I'm Jeff Glor, CBS News in New York. Scott Pelley will be here tomorrow. Good night.